I've said for a long time <clears throat> uh, that difficulties are coming in our country, and I've, I've always thought, just uh, off the top of my head, I've always thought, well, we, as Christian people, we better figure out what our role is to the government, to Christ, uh, Christ first, of course, and what is our role in government, and what, how far do we go in resisting, and what do we do when things are going to get tough? I've, I've thought that for 20 years. And I've been saying that, but I think the time is coming where we better get real serious about what, what is our role? What should we be about? And how do we navigate the, the choppy waters that are approaching, that are coming up in our country? Because I don't, I don't say good things approaching, really. That's just my opinion. I may be wrong. And I hope I am. I really do hope I am. But I don't think that uh, we have portending good things approaching in our future. So... Uh, but that's just uh, my general thoughts, and so. But it does call us to mind that we need to be uh, very, very sober and serious about Christianity, what our role is uh, to Christ, to the church, and to the government. What is what is our role, and how how are we to resist if we are to resist? So, all of those questions are things that we, uh, of course, this class is not about, but something to think about. So let's uh, talk about for just a few moments before we go on here. Oh, you know what? I forgot to. Yeah, I forget, I forget my remote control <laughs> when I get going here. So what I'm thinking about, first of all, is the last line on this particular, uh, on this particular screen, which is hagiolatry, and that would be the worship of the saints. So <clears throat> connected with that is the glorification of Mary, which we'll talk about uh, in the next class period. And then the class will be finished, as I mentioned. But today I want to talk about this, and we want to talk about the Crusades. And let's, uh, let's kind of think about uh, how, how these things came about. So there are two, two areas that we need to think about regarding this um, when we come to the Crusades. But let's think about hagiolatry. So hagiolatry means, hagios means holy. Olatry, that's, these are, hagios is a, a, a saint, and that would be the worship of, or the intercession of saints. So how did, that, how did that come about? So it was made official in 788 A.D., which is really nothing less than polytheism encroaching itself upon the church. So how, how did that happen? How did, how did polytheism become so a part of the Roman church, and yet they would more or less baptize it and bring it into the Roman Catholic concept? How did that happen? Well, one way that it happened was by, by the wedding of the church and the state. And when that occurs, uh, then the state made it mandatory to be a Christian. So if we make it mandatory to be a Christian, then what, what is going to take place in Iowa Park if we made Christianity or if the civil government of Iowa Park in Wichita Falls made it mandatory to be a member of the Church of Christ? What would happen? How is that, how, what would that look like? Say again. Upheaval. Let's be specific. What kind of upheaval would we have? So the, the city council of Wichita Falls makes it mandatory that you must worship in this, in this county in the Church of Christ. Now what, what is going to happen? That's right. Or the religious background, no matter if it's a church or whatever it may be. Yeah, people will be here. Yeah, we can increase the attendance now by making it a civil code. You have to attend church. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. That would be, a, and, and that would not be, that was kind of like in the, not exactly like, but in the colonial period, even after the Constitution was framed, there were state churches. What are state churches? There were state, the state church of Maryland was the Roman church. That was the only state that had the Roman Catholic church. The other, church, uh, other states had, for example, the Congregational Churches and, and other churches, Episcopal Churches, that were the state churches. What is a state church? Okay, number one, it was governed by the state, governed by the state laws, number one. Something else very, very, very important that is a part of it that really is what we rebelled against. Okay, that's part of it too. That's part of it too. That's church leaders, politics, all, everything lined up 
something else happened here. Yes, unconstitutional, but why, why, why do we make it unconstitutional? Okay, we wanted freedom of religion. What was going, that's true. What was going on though? There's something else that we're missing, a huge, huge, huge link. Your tax money is going to be taken to pay the preacher. Whether you go or not, whether you attend the church or not, you're going to pay the preacher. So everybody in Wichita County is going to be taxed and they're going to pay the Bill Lockwoods of the churches. Well, what do you think about that? Does, well, what if you disagree with what Bill Lockwood teaches? Doesn't matter, you're gonna pay him anyway. What if you disagree with the Episcopal Church and you say, I don't believe in Episcopal Church doctrine. You're paying, the, you're supporting it with your money anyway. Doesn't matter. That's the key because it was state supported. Well, that still goes on, yeah. Yeah, that followed it. I mean, you don't have the ability to choose a preacher, so there's less freedom. There's less freedom in all these areas, that's true. But the real, the real kicker was, you're gonna pay your taxes, you're gonna go to, okay, tax season's coming up, April 15th, they're gonna take a chunk of that, and they're gonna pay the preacher in the official state church, correct? Did I mention something we should not have mentioned? Taxis, everybody kind of squirmed right there. It's like, ah! So, so that's, that's exactly how it was, the state church. So that's what happened with the Roman church. The people that were in the civil government were paying the preachers, or the priests as they called them. And so, not only so, but it made it mandatory that you had to be a part of that church. So you're going to bring in all of your ideas, all of your concepts, all of your pagan gods, and you're going to bring them in. And then you're going to baptize them, and you're going to make them saints. So there's a saint for everything. There's a saint for this. Saint. Where did all this come from? Well, it came from the idea that all of these foreign people coming into the church wanted to bring in their own religious ideas, and so they basically Christianized, we could say, the pagan concepts, and they just brought them in. So it's a mixture, that's why I've always said the Roman church, and not to be ugly, but is a mixture of Bible, but a lot of mixture of paganism brought in. And that's, so that brings about hagiolatry, that is the worship of the saints. So we're going to have intercession through the saints. So let's look at a passage for just a moment. And we'll use this passage in the next a couple of classes and this will be in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. <clears throat> now, this one you might recognize just immediately, just off the top of your head, as speaking about Jesus Christ as the only mediator. So let's look at the text. There is one God and one mediator between God and man himself man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony to be born in its own times. Whereunto I was appointed a preacher and apostle, I speak the truth, I lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So we have one God and one mediator between God and man, one person that is mediating between God and man, himself man, Christ Jesus. However, in the pagan concept, now we need to think about this for a moment, in the pagan concept of, of God, the gods did not want anything to do with man. Nothing. Consequently, your job as a religious person was to somehow sway the gods to get involved in your life. Now how, Let's just stop for a moment. How does that differ from Christianity? Obvious, it's obvious right on the surface of it because in Christ we have, well, God sent Christ into the world, participated in manhood, and he is ever ready to hear and answer prayer. This is 1 John chapter 5. We know that if whatever we pray, 
He hears us. We know that whatsoever we ask, we have the petitions which you've asked of him. And he's willing and eager and responsive to our prayers. But pagan idea is different. Pagan says, no, the gods are far off. They don't want anything to do with mankind. So your job is to get the gods to move on your behalf. And only some people had that ability. And you might think, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, the contest of Mount Carmel. Here the, the doctors of Baal, that is the pagan priests, what do they do? To get their God to move and answer prayer. What do they do? Do they pray? They, they get around the altar? This is a contest with Elijah. Do they all just get around and pray? No, what do they do? They dance. They cut themselves with knives. They let the blood flow. They want, they, they're trying to get God to move. Will you do something to move? Because the gods do not want to be involved in human affairs. That's a complete different idea, paganism, than we have in Christianity. But this pagan concept came into the churches now because we're, we've made it a law that, you know, okay, Christianity is now the only legal religion, so people are coming in and they're bringing these pagan ideas. So we're going to, we're going to not only bring in their gods and baptize them, so to speak, but they now become saints, and these saints are those through whom we get to, to whom we pray. As a matter of fact, one of the comments, we'll make this uh, in uh, next week, thinking, if Lord willing, if I can remember to bring it up. But the very concept that Mary becomes a mediatrix, that a mediator to go to Christ, comes out of, is born of this idea. And that is that Jesus Christ does not want to hear your prayer. God doesn't want to hear it, but there is someone there who will touch his heart, and she is his mother, and she will get him to answer your prayer. And so you pray through Mary because she's the one who has the power with Christ because he is he's aloof. He doesn't want anything to do with it. Now that's Roman Catholic doctrine right now, and in, in, in right in the modern Catholic encyclopedia, she is the mediatrix and she will go. That's why we have Mary the mediatrix. And that's also why we have the hagiolatry. That is, all these saints, you have these different saints that you pray to and you ask to protect yourself. So, for example, Erasmus was in the Reformation period. This would be the 1500s, 16th century. And he noted that fugitive nuns prayed to saints for help in hiding their sins, rather than praying to God for forgiveness. They're praying to the saints, hide their sins. Merchants prayed to the saints to make a rich haul. Gamblers were praying to the saints to have luck. And just it goes on and on. Then we have relics also a worship. Erasmus made this comment. He said, there was enough wood for, of the true cross of Christ to make a ship. And he said, that's how, that, because the relics, because the relics became avenues by which uh, they were able to have this, the big traffic. And so that's, that's what was going on. So all of this, <clears throat> it was just no longer simple faith in Christ. It was no longer reliance upon his blood and that Jesus Christ is the mediator. But all of these other things came in the way. So that's what's happening with hagiolatry and how the worship of the saints got moving. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So... <clears throat> And by the way, I, I say this, uh, in the modern Catholic encyclopedia, I had a, I think I have a comment, right, matter of fact, it's right here on this page. And I say this because I don't want people to think I'm being ugly about the Roman church, but they, they point out this. <clears throat> they make a comment, they say, in the 16th century, the scandalous abuse of indulgences was one of the causes that brought about the Reformation. They recognized, even, even the modern Catholic encyclopedia says it was a scandalous uh, abuse of what's going on. But that, that is a part of it because once you set up a system of indulgences, which is the merits of Christ are treasured up here somewhere, now we're going to pay to, to get those merits to come out by means of the priest. Well, then it just any, anywhere, you can go anywhere you want to go with that, right? Let, just think about this, for example. I use it, this is an illustration, socialism. Our founding fathers made socialism <clears throat> unconstitutional. You cannot Take money from one party and give it to another party. Why? No, absolutely not. They made that comment over and over and over again. I mean, I remember Samuel Adams said, 
in our government, this kind of action, taking from one person and giving to another, or one class of people giving to another class, is flatly unconstitutional. But once it got started in the time of Woodrow Wilson, particularly in FDR's period, once you start as a politician, I'm taking from her and giving to him, then I have automatically purchased his vote, haven't I? <laughs> I've, I've, I've just gained his vote. But now, not only that, the sky's the limit because it's only my imagination now that stops me from taking from her and giving to this and giving to that and giving to whatever I want to give to. Whatever, whatever pleases me, whatever I can think of, if I, my, the imagination is as far as it will take me. And that's exactly what happened. Once you start on the principle of removing from one and giving to another, it's the same thing here. Once you start the principle of indulgences, that there's an idea that there's a merits treasury in heaven and that the priest has the power to get those merits and apply them to you, apply them to you, as long as you give me money, then, then the sky's the limit. <laughs> It just doesn't, it doesn't matter what I'm applying it to. And then there's abuses going to come in the train. So that's how that got rolling. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> now, I've not converted any. Um, personally, my grandmother did. You know, one of my best friends came out of the Roman church. Um, but, but I was, uh, when I left Arizona, I was a teenager. So, but I grew up with Catholics and Mormons. So I did not, I did not get a chance to convert any of them then. And I have studied with them several times since then. Uh, I have had several studies in, uh, when I was in juvenile detention. There were several Roman Catholics there, but it was kind of a stilted study because we were at, on, at work, and they would, you know, so that was a little bit diff difficult. That's correct. <clears throat> That's right. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where we, okay, so <clears throat> here's the argument. So I have had a chance to debate in a public forum in California with the Roman Catholic, matter of fact, they have, a, they have a professional Roman Catholic debating society. And yeah, they do, they have several of them. And one of them is called Catholic Answers. And the man's name was Bob Sungenis, and we've had that on videotape. It's, um, anyway, it was in like 1999. So I went to Visalia, California. So here's, here's the argument that they utilize to show it. That is that the Bible is the seed, the seed is the word of God, it's a seed. But the tree, but the tree grows through the years. And so you don't have all that you need in the seed because so you look at the, you look at the oak tree and it doesn't look like the seed. So they use that concept to say that the church uh, was only given seed form in the New Testament, but the growth came later. And so all of these growths, all the branches on it that you see come out of that seed. It's very easy to show, however, that that is a non-starter. For one thing, just take for an example. What is, what is one of the qualifications of a bishop or an elder in the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3? What is the one of the qualifications, physical qualifications? When I mean physical, I don't mean, you know, he must be, um, must be sober-minded and so forth. But what do I mean by a physical qualification? What's one of those qualifications? What are the physical qualifications for an elder, by the way? One wife, got to be married, has to be married. All right, so think about this. The bishop must be the husband of one wife. The Roman church says the bishop cannot be married. So I point out, <clears throat> just as an illustration, that the Roman church law that a bishop cannot be married is not an outgrowth of the, being a husband of one wife. It's a, it's a contradiction. It doesn't grow out of it. That's just one illustration out of hundreds that can be utilized to show that this is not the case. It's not a growth. We have the complete package in the New Testament. So that's just one illustration that, you know, husband of one wife doesn't come out to be, don't be married at all. <laughs> That just that there's no way that you can say that's what the growth outgrowth of something else. So that's how that's handled usually. <clears throat> that is that is the growth through the years. So all right. So um, at any rate, so that's that idea, the treasury of marriage. So that brings us to the next particular point, and I wanted to get into it today because uh, this is. <clears throat> Uh, David asked about it uh, last week, I believe, and we talked about some of the crusades. So let's talk about what happened here. And why is it important? 
First of all, number one, why is it important to notice the Crusades, which in the 12th and 13th centuries? Whenever we discuss with anybody the Bible, becoming a Christian, particularly those in the, in the secular world, they're always or seemingly frequently bringing up that, well, you know what? Christians killed people too. Christians killed people too. And they just go on and on with that. So if you talk about, for example, uh, when I had debates with uh, Muslims, more than one, and they will say, well, and I talk about, here's what's right in the Quran. So, well, Christians killed people too. So what's the answer to that? The answer is, number one, this is, we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. And I have as little to do with the Roman Church as I do with Islam. As a matter of fact, the Roman Church persecuted, put to trial, and killed people who wanted to worship God by the simplicity of the New Testament and translate the New Testament into the tongues of, of other people. They killed them. They put them at the, burned them at the stake. I said, that's, let's not confuse Roman Catholicism with New Testament Christianity. Now, I know that you, to say that, it's like, okay, that's a pretty stark statement. But it has to be made because that's the truth of the matter. And, and I tell you, in our society, we soft soap everything so much that, well, I, I, I know that they're Christians and they shouldn't have done that. No, no. This is, this is the Roman church really had very little to do with the New Testament. And so I pointed out in the Muslim debate, I said that has not to do with New Testament Christianity. It has to do with the Roman Catholic church that was wedded to the state and was at a, an apostasy. The New Testament talks about the Roman church, 1 Timothy 4, as well as in 2 Thessalonians 2, as an apostate movement. It's an apostasy. That's not New Testament Christianity. But I see this all the time. You might see it on Facebook. You might see it. I talk to people, for example, that are college educated. They say, well, Christians kill people. And you hear that right now in, our, in the secular, in the debate You're on television. They're talking about Christians kill people because it is politically correct to refer to Roman Catholicism as Christian. So that's, so that's what we need to keep, I think, in my mind at least, clear and separated. All right, comments on that. I say that because it's, it's important. If we, don't, if we can't find our bearing here, then we are going to have a hard time. So let's see what happened here. So the Crusades <clears throat> started in 1094. That would be, <clears throat> that'd be almost the 12th century here. And so um, once the doctrine of penance, the treasury of merits are up here that we can, we can draw from and apply to you. And, and only the priest can do that. Take from those treasury, apply to you. Once that's in place, as I said, well, the sky's the limit because now we're going to apply it in different areas. So in order, in order to recruit an army in France, Urban number two, who was the Pope in Rome, and they, and they had aligned with French, um, diplomats, they promised merits, meritorious action for those who would come into the army and go down to Palestine and, and redeem Palestine from the Muslim control. So what had happened? Well, <clears throat> earlier, about a century before, Muslims had conquered Palestine. Actually, many years before, and then they, they had different uh, Turks and then uh, Muslims from the east and Turks were from the Muslims from the west and they fought over it, but they, they took Palestine and they had it. So behind that even, let's go back even all the way to the time of Constantine. Constantine's mother was Helena and Helena, remember, was a Christian and she wanted to go to Palestine and she wanted to identify the sites where certain things happened, occurred in Bible times. And she, so she went over there and she did that. Then she had things built there and so forth. And so this was something that Christians wanted to do. They wanted to go to Palestine and identify the places. So now 
moving ahead, just jumping ahead about five centuries, once the Roman church is now firmly established, first pope is crowned 606 A.D., and all this is going on now, and penance is now the treasury of merits that they're going to be able to grab those merits and apply them to people. So now what do we do? So be, now behind that also, there's a political movement because uh, the, the Roman Empire, remember, had divided between the east, which was seated at Constantinople, and the west, seated at Rome. And Alexius was the Holy Roman Emperor in Constantinople. And he didn't like the Muslims being so aggressive and taking so many territories, so he wanted, he wanted to go down there and he wanted to push the Muslims back. So it was all po politics behind the scene, but he appealed to Urban Number 2, the Pope in Rome, and said, let's, let's get together. They had been divided. Let's get together and let's go down, take an army, and let's release or redeem Palestine. Get rid of the Muslims out of there. How are we going to get them? We recruit the army by promising indulgences, treasury of merits of Christ applied to you if you go and fight in the war. All right, what about that recruiting technique? That's not how we sign up today, is it? <laughs> treasury of merits, uh, you know, merits for your morals. And so that's how they did it. So the first army launched off in 1094. And this was the first, and they call it the crusade. So they had, I don't remember exactly, I have a number of how many soldiers they had. But the direct cause was the appeal of the Pope to the people to rescue the Holy Lands from the Turks. We've got to get rid of those Turks and drive them out. So the Pope organized it, Alexius helped it, and the three motives are these. Number one, to rescue the Holy Land and make it available to European Catholic pilgrims. They, because pilgrimage is also a way that you can gain merit. By the way, how did, how did, um, how did they, how, do, how would you get people to be a pil to be a, to come to Wichita Falls, for example, how do we get people to come here and spend money? How do we get them, just broadly speaking, huh? Okay, we have a festival, we'll have put up a great big hotel downtown, we'll have a convention center, and why do we do all of that? Come here, spend money. That's right. Now, if the Air Force base left, we would be like uh, Electra tomorrow. But <laughs> that's what this. But right now, the Air Force base here keeps keeps things thriving. But we want more, so we put for commerce. We bring people here. Well, in those days, they didn't do it. They didn't do it that way. They they collected different cities would collect relics, and these relics were places that. Uh, such as splinters from the cross of Christ, or a piece of the thorn that was on Christ's brow, or the shroud of Turin, that was kind of a modern day one, or it might be a nail that had nailed one of the apostles to the cross, or it might be just a, a, a thousand and one things. And so they would, these different municipalities would collect these relics. And that would draw pilgrims to come to their town and spend money. They didn't build a convention hall, they would have a collection of relics. Well, people wanted to go down to the Palestine. It was not necessarily to collect relics, but it was, it was a, an avenue by which they can gain merit to go to the very place where Christ was. Now, I, I like doing those kinds of things, but I don't think that there's any merit. If I go stand by the Samaritan well, I think, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Samaritan well, still there today, where Jesus in John 4 spoke to the Samaritan woman is the only place that's still there that you can actually say X marks the spot. He was right here. Our Lord was right here. Most other places, it's like, oh, we think it was right here. We think Hill of Calvary. We're not quite certain. The, the tomb, we're not quite certain, but we do know about the Samaritan well. But at any rate, you can see how people want to go there. And then they, as long as they have this meritorious system in place, they'll go. So they would collect these relics. So that was one, one way that they wanted to get them to go. So to make it available to European Catholic pilgrims. Then number two, to assist Eastern Christians, Alexius. That is, Alexius wanted to drive the Muslims out of there. They were too close to his empire. And number three, uh, it was to bring an end to the schism in the church. The Eastern and the Western churches had already divided, which we talked about. So those was, was the motivation. So they, they took off 
1094, Urban Number Two organized it. And what happened? Well, they got down there and they actually captured Jerusalem. It was not going to be that way for long, but they did capture Jerusalem and they set up a crusader uh, government that was there in Jerusalem. Uh, the Muslim was going to take it back, but now what do we have? We have actual war. Now think about this, the Roman church actually organizing an army and going down and fighting. That's, that's unusual, isn't it? If we think about New Testament Christianity, what we are to be about. Can you imagine the apostles standing up and saying, let's go fight, let's go fight the Jews. Let's, let's get in there and let's have an army and let's march into Jerusalem and just take it back. Can you imagine Paul and Peter doing that? The, the, the idea is so monstrous and so foreign, but that's how far things have moved along. So that's what they did in 1094. That was the first one. So Urban convened a synod at Clermont, France, and he urged the people of France to lead the crusade to drive the Turks from Palestine. Financial considerations were there as well. A famine had swept Europe. People thought they might reestablish themselves financially, so they say, hey, let's go down there. And how would you establish yourselves financially going to war? Yeah, plunder, it's called plunder. You're gonna go plunder, and that's what they were going to do. So that was the first crusade. Uh, they, they got down there, they took Jerusalem, and then <clears throat> didn't stay that way. So we have the second, through the fifth crusades also taking place. So that first crusade, they took, they, first of all, they came down to um, the city of Nicaea and they took it, they went down to Antioch, took it. And it's kind of interesting, when they got to Antioch, the, the words, they were, they were really being defeated by the Turks, uh, by the Muslims. This is before they got to Jerusalem. And the word spread through the army that they had found a piece of the cross of Christ. And so everybody was excited. This is why they had come. This is the reason they came. And it re-energized the, the army, and they were able to, they, they resurged, they won the battle, and because we were finding pieces of the cross of Christ. And so that's how they were motivating themselves as they went on. So that, but when they got to Jerusalem, only one quarter of the soldiers remained to reach Jerusalem. And Godfrey of Bouillon had been the moral leader of the crusade. He sent his brother Baldwin as the king over Jerusalem. And at that point, they established two orders of knights. And they were, number one, the Hospitaliers and the Templars. And you know those names. They established that order of knight. And that would be, of course, to maintain control of Jerusalem. We're going to have to maintain control. So the Knights Templar were organized then. And that's how they came about. All right, any, any thoughts on that? So the second crusade took place. The Muslims took the city of Edessa, which would be in northern Israel, 1144. And so in 1147, Bernard of Clairvaux stirred up the king of France and the emperor to lead another crusade to recover lands that were taken by Muslims. So it's just back and forth, back and forth. That's all that's going on. The leaders were Louis VII of France primarily, and the dates of that second crusade are here. Now at this time, it's not going to go so well. It ends in a miserable failure. Thousands are killed when they get to Asia Minor. They, they die and they just, there's no, nothing going on there with it. And so they finally, when they reached Damascus, they did not capture it. They did not capture Damascus, Syria, and they went home. And so it was just a, a huge, huge failure, the second one. Then Muslims, because they were now emboldened, they recaptured Jerusalem. That was 1187. So that brings about the third crusade. And so it goes on and on this way. So just basically summarizing it, we can see how all of this transpires. It just is one army after the other. So Richard, this is where Richard of England, the King of England, who earned his name, what was his name? Or what was his uh, nickname? Lionheart. This is where Richard the Lionheart uh, comes down here. And he actually is fairly successful. He doesn't capture Jerusalem, but he does, uh, he does set up a treaty with the Muslims in, in Jerusalem and said, we, allow us at least to come down and make pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem. So that's how all these crusades were taking place. But it was based upon, important to see, based upon the concepts that we have a treasury of merits here and the priests are in control of those treasury of merits and we're going to apply those to individuals as long as they, 
as, as long as you go fight in the war. So instead of promising you, what do they, what do they promise today? If you could join the military, you get, um, I guess you get, uh, huh? Okay, college, uh, you get, how, okay, housing, college, you might, you might get, a, a, you go to a trade school or something. I, that's some, somewhat like that, the recruitment, Dan, is that it? I mean, you have, I think some branches have more than others incentives. I see, yeah. I remember uh, when Scott, at one point, they, they sent him to, um, I guess, the War College in Pennsylvania. There's Army barracks there or something. I don't, I'm not sure where. But anyway, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. But it was, of course, to further him along in command positions or whatever. But, so that, but they give you an education. They educate you along the way so that you're prepared. I guess when you get out, you can, you can make a living and so forth. So. And a lot, and a lot of uh, guys in high school, you know, they're so. But that's the same concept, except here they're talking about spiritual credits instead of an occupation, and that's exactly what's happening with the Roman Church at this period. So, yes, sir. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, the Muslims had already conquered most of that southern world. They, uh, a, the, the Near East. Uh, near Asia, and also um, reaching over into Turkey, which was still Asia. They conquered all of that, and they had made inroads all the way up into, into Spain, and they were stopped, um, forgotten which war it was, but they were stopped in Spain, but it looked, it looked like they might t take all of Europe, and so they were, the, the Roman church was very, very concerned. <clears throat> Muhammad started his uh, I, uh, practices in the fifth, let's say, the sixth century. So that would be, uh, let's see, I think he was born in five, um, 590 something, and six, uh, through the six, uh, through the, would it be the seventh century. So I think he died in about 630, something like that. They, they, that's right. So, so, within, so within a century after Muhammad was born and died, I think he died in 632. Uh, within a century after he died, they conquered all of Arabia. They had conquered the entire peninsula of Arabia. By the way, you might note this, there's not one person on the entire peninsula that disagreed with him. That tells you a lot about what, what was going on. And that's how they did it. And then they, went, then they stepped right up into it. They took Syria, Palestine, all that in the centuries immediately following. And that, that was worrisome to... Uh, the Roman Church, which was now a secular empire itself. Yeah. Any other questions on it? Yes, ma'am. Well, the spiritual benefit would be that they will apply the merits of Christ to you. They'll give you, so I have the Pope, I'm going to give you merits. Indulgences, I'm going to give you the merits of Christ if you do thus and so. And so if you're going to go to war, I'm going to, I'm going to dispense the merits of Christ to you. You don't have access to them except through me. <laughs> that's right. And that's how, that's how it is. The Pope is, Pope is right. The Pope is the one. In, he's, he is the uh, vicar of Christ, as they say. And so he stands for, uh, he's the apostle of Christ on the earth. So he dispenses what he dispenses. And you're not going to get it otherwise. So, so, and through the pre, now they, through that, the priesthood system, they, he also does it through the priesthood system, the tentacles of the priesthood. So, but you're not going to do it outside of that, the established system of the priesthood. And this is all why people rebelled against it in the, in the uh, Reformation period. So, part, partly reason. So, any other thoughts? Yes, sir. Yeah. It was kind of a back and forth, just like it, just like in Europe today. It's like the same thing in Europe. So. All right, so what I want to do with this class, one more class on this material, uh, and, I, and I apologize, sometimes it's not too edifying, um, but, I want, I want, but it's important for us to see some of these things. And so next week we'll talk about what are called the glories of Mary, and then after that we're changing gears, and we're talking about evangelism, personal evangelism, what is our responsibility as individual Christians to win people to Christ, and what... What should, how should we go about our business doing that? Yeah, all right. Any other thoughts? Okay. Thank you for your participation.